This weekend, as I mentioned, many of you know, I was basking in the warmth of southern India uh, last weekend, where I was blessed to preach uh, several times at the Kerala Bible Seminary and College. They had a big, huge crusade. I preached Friday night. I preached for their uh, church service last Sunday. I was blessed to be the commencement speaker uh, for the Bible College and Seminary graduation. It was my third trip, uh, a preaching trip to India, and while it was a great, uh, quick whirlwind trip, it was a blessing, and I bring you greetings from hundreds of pastors and thousands of Christians in the southern state of Kerala in India. But as much as I'm blessed uh, to be able to go to other places to, to preach and speak, I always love coming back to this church, this church that I love so, so deeply. And if you've been with us over the last couple of weeks, you know then that this is our vision theme for 2018. I love my church. That's what we've been talking about. And hopefully you've, you've, uh, you've heard the messages and you've bought, you've bought the t-shirt if you haven't already done that. We have a whole bunch more out there today. Uh, we'll, just like we want you to check in on Facebook, as I mentioned the other day, or just a minute ago, I should say, uh, we want you to, to wear your shirts. If, if, you, if you wear them sometime, maybe that'll spark some a conversation from uh, family and friends, people around you. And it's just a simple little way to kind of start a conversation for people that maybe can turn into a spiritual conversation where you can encourage people with the love and the grace of Christ. More so, this series, I Love My Church, has been designed to communicate uh, some vision as to some of the most elementary uh, foundational values that guide our church. Uh, visionary principles that form the basis of our church, and they're really reasons why I think uh, you can love this church. And while I could probably come up with an exhaustive list of reasons why I think you should love this church, we kind of held ourselves down to three. In, in week one, if you were here, we talked about one of the first reasons why you should love this church is because we are committed uh, to preaching the Bible, our commitment to God's Word. The Scripture says, in Psalm 119, 105, your word is a lamp unto my feet. And what? What does it say? And it's a light. It's a light on my path. I believe that. I believe, uh, and I'm committed to teaching the Bible and committed and uh, challenging you not only to know it, but to live your life accordingly. And so we're going to talk more about that here in a couple of moments, but that was our first message. Last week then, Pastor Rob uh, preached on how the church is life-changing, and, and you can love this church because we encourage you to let this place and the teaching that you get here to change your life, to, to, to change every aspect of your life, to encourage you to, from a commitment to helping you get connected and involved in a ministry to helping you figure out you, right? And sometimes, let's be honest, sometimes figuring you out is the hardest part, isn't it? Because you is, you is kind of a unique person, <laughs> And you has got a lot of stuff going on that's causing you to be the way that you are. And so we, we have some opportunities for you to get involved in emotionally healthy spirituality so that you can, you can figure that out. If you miss either one of these messages, you can go to our website, check them out online. We'd love for you to do that. Well, grab your outlines and uh, grab your Bibles. Turn in your Bibles to Acts chapter 2. And Sandy, uh, can you grab some Bibles back there and raise your hands if you need a Bible? And, and uh, Sandy will bring some around and pass them out to you. Take out your outline. In this last and uh, final little uh, you know, version of this series, uh, final installment, yet another reason why I think you can love this church is because from day one here at Westbrook, we have been committed to and have a desire to be real and relevant. You see that? We want to be real and relevant. And when I say real and relevant, I'm not talking about being hip and trendy, <laughs> okay? I mean... Because seriously, look at me. You know, I am not a hip and trendy dude. I'm just not, right? Uh, I, I mean, tr picture me trying to be hip and trendy. Just think about that, right? If I was hip and trendy, I'd look like one of these, these preachers here, you know. I'd try to look like that, and I'd be covered with tattoos, and I'd have some crazy hairstyle, and, and, and I'd wear skinny jeans, and, and I'd have a V-cut t-shirt, and, and uh, can you think about this, all right? It just, it just wouldn't, wouldn't work for me. So when I say real and relevant, I'm not talking about uh, being hip and trendy. I'm, I'm not saying that our desire is to be the hippest, hottest, coolest church in town. What I mean by that is this. We don't want to be a church to be cheesy. We don't want to be a church that has the same old cliches. We don't want the self-help 
version of the gospel. We, we, want, we don't want the show. We don't want the performances or the spotlights. We don't want church to be fake. We don't want church uh, to, to be, you know, like this, this superficial thing. We want the church to be real. We want, when you walk in here uh, with whatever's going on in your life, and here's what I know, here's what I can pretty much uh, say with some certainty, that a lot of you, when you drove in this parking lot, you were fighting with each other like cats and dogs. Am I right? Now, see, you don't want to admit it, but I know you were. Some of you were. You were yelling at your kids. You were frustrated because you were late. We're always late, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. That's how you're feeling. And so you walk in here and you have all manner of things going on in your brain, all manner of things happening. And you walk in here and, and the first person is the greeter and they say, how are you doing? And just a second ago, you were, had the snarl and the blood coming out of your teeth. And then you walked in and you said, hi, I'm fine. <laughs> and you're not fine. You're, we know that you're not fine. Because not everybody's fine. And so we, we don't, we, here's what we want. We want when you walk in here and you sit down and you kind of unload and you kind of just like plop down and realizing that some of you, you really don't want to be here right now. You were forced and drug beat to be here. We want you in that moment when you begin to relax and you begin to settle in that you begin to sense God in this place. And I was talking to one of our elders quickly this morning. He said, I just feel heaviness kind of in this place. And I said, that's awesome because we've been telling people today, we want you to be real. And when people are being real with each other, Robert, heaviness is what it's all about. That's what happens. We want you when you're real with what's going on in your life, then you begin to get a sense of Jesus in this place. And we want Jesus to be in this room. Because then when you walk out of this place, there's maybe a spring in your step and a spring in your spirit, even though you've got some of the same challenges that you faced when you were coming in, maybe you have a better perspective on how to deal with it. You see, are you with me so far? That's the kind of church we want to be. And that doesn't mean that we're not going to use videos and we're not going to use technology and we're not going to use lights and we're not going to use great music and, and all of those things. It's just this. It, it's that those, those trappings of the modern day church is not our main focus. Our focus is to be real and relevant. And that's what I want to talk about today. How, what does that look like? How do we as a church become a church that's real and relevant? I want Westbrook to, to look and to feel just like the church in the first century that we can read about. Acts chapter 2, if you have your Bibles, go ahead and open up to that passage of Scripture. It's where we read about this and where we learn about this. We, we learn about this church that, that, that was vibrant and impacting and inspiring and dedicated to keeping the main thing the main thing. How's that for a cliche? But we want to do that. We want a church that's real and relevant and focused. And what we learn from the first century church is that they were committed and they were dedicated to do four things. And it grew, and it prospered. And so what I want to do today is I want to show you these four things, and then I'm going to end with some additional uh, commitments and uh, stuff that may surprise you when you put them in the category of real and relevant. But I think they'll all apply. And so let's begin to look at this. Acts chapter 2, go ahead and open to that in your Bibles, if you will. Now, we haven't preached uh, here at Westbrook for a couple of years through the book of Acts, and we haven't really looked at how the church first started uh, if you've recently begun attending here and you're, maybe you're not really familiar with this part of church history, let me give you a jet tour. Is that okay? So I'm going to give you a fast jet tour, so listen really fast, all right? So here's how it all began. Jesus was born in a manger, no room in the inn. You all remember this piece? Say yes, you do. You all know what I'm talking about? We just kind of studied that a couple of weeks ago. That's how Jesus was born. We talked about that, the Christmas story. You then read through the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke and John, and you kind of get the idea there that Jesus grew up. And, and even though there's not a lot of information about his growing up years, there's, there's some little tiny tidbits of information, like when, when Jesus was around 12 years old and his family went to Jerusalem, remember, to celebrate some of the, the Jewish feasts, and then they were on their way back uh, to their home and they couldn't find Jesus. Remember that story? And so they raced back to Jerusalem, they couldn't find Jesus. Finally, they found him in the temple. He was around 12 years old. That's about the only, the only snippet of information that we have uh, when Jesus was growing up. But, but Luke chapter 2 and verse 52 ends with this. It says this. It says, Jesus grew in wisdom and in stature and in favor with God and all of the people. 
So during those ensuing years, Jesus was growing up. Well, then he gets uh, to be around 30 years old. Jesus uh, comes back onto the scene, and the four Gospels pick up the story and tells us about his ministry. Are you tracking with me so far? Yes, tell me yes if you are. Okay, you're tracking with me. This is good. I'm going to keep going on fast, all right? His ministry then, his three-year ministry, came to a conclusion with his death on the cross, the Easter story. You know what I'm talking about, okay? His burial, his resurrection from the grave, big deal. It's what Christianity is all based upon, all founded upon. Most people here are up on that part of the Jesus story. Then the Bible says that Jesus spent some time with his followers after his resurrection. In fact, 40 days uh, to be exact. And then the Bible says that he ascended up to heaven. He, he just like kind of like, whoop, just ascended up with God. The Bible then says that seven days later, the Holy Spirit descended upon the followers of Christ. Read Acts chapter 1. Are you with me so far? Some of you, most of you, okay? Peter preaches the first gospel message, Acts chapter 1, Acts chapter 2. People respond. They respond to the message that he's preaching, and they baptize 3,000 people on that first day. And so that's how the church that's how the church began. The church began pretty big, didn't it? In fact, there's really not, I mean, in this town, even town, Bolingbroke, Romeo, there's not any churches of 3,000 people around us. Maybe one day Westbrook will be a church of, of 3,000. But here's what they found. They found themselves continuing to grow, continuing to reach people. And here's how they did it. I believe the Bible here tells us in Acts chapter 2, they were committed to four things. Look at the screen. Here's how it reads. Follow along in your Bible. Ready? It says, Peter replied, Each of you must repent of your sins and turn to God and be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins. Then you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. This promise is to you, to your children, to those far away, all who have been called by the Lord our God. And then Peter continued preaching for a long time, strongly urging all of his listeners Save yourselves from this crooked generation. Sounds like 2018, doesn't it? Save yourselves from this crooked generation. And those who believed what Peter said were baptized and added to the church that day about 3,000 in all. Now you were here when we had like 30 or 40 baptisms all in one day and it was really cool. Can you imagine 3,000? You've been at Pelican Harbor when we baptized 40 people or so. 3,000? Amazing. Verse 42, all the believers devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching, to fellowship, to the sharing in meals, including the Lord's Supper, and to prayer. And a deep sense of awe came over them all, and the apostles performed many miraculous signs and wonders. All the believers met together in one place and shared everything they had. They sold their property and possessions and shared the money with those in need. They worshiped together at the temple each day, met in homes for the Lord's Supper, shared their meals with great joy and generosity, all the while praising God and enjoying the goodwill of the people. And look at this last line. And every day, each day, the Lord added to their fellowship those who were being saved. So like that first day, like 3,000, like every day, more and more and more people were getting connected into this thing called the church. They kept growing. They kept growing. And here's how. They were committed to four things. Look at chapter 2, verse 42 in your Bible. First of all, they were committed to the faithful preaching of God's word. The faithful preaching of God's word. Acts 2, 42. They devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching. Do you see that? See that there? The apostles' teaching would be the word of God. It would be the, the Bible. The, the apostles taught the inspired word of God. And we talked about this when it linked a couple of weeks ago. Now we have it what is contained in the Bible. That's why we just want to preach the Bible. We just want to do Bible things in Bible ways and call Bible things Bible names. And I believe it can help us. I believe it can make a difference in our lives. Will it, will it do anything for us? Well, I think it's all in how you look at it. Reminds me of the story that I, I saw the other day, this, this preacher, long, long years ago, this preacher was driving down the road, a kind of a country road, it was getting late at night, and, and his car broke down. And this was long before the days of, of GPS tracking and cellular service and cellular phones and so forth. He didn't know what to do, and he got out of his car, he tried to figure it out himself, and, and finally he slammed the hood down, and he looked up, and he noticed that down the road he saw the lights of a honky-tonk. 
he saw the lights of kind of a happening roadside bar, you know, and so he said, well, I'll just go down there and I'll call a tow truck, and so he made his way down to this this honky-tonk, and he used the the phone there at the honky-tonk, and he called the tow truck driver, and then he was waiting for them to come and pick him up and pick up his car, and as he did so, he stood there kind of surveying the crowd in the honky-tonk, and he noticed that over at the bar sat an old friend of his named Frank, and Frank was plastered out of his gourd. I mean, he had been drinking who knows what for who knows how long. And he was shabbily dressed, and he was just tanked. I mean, he was out of it. And the preacher was kind of an ordinary preacher, a little bit like me, kind of, probably. And so he walked up, and he wanted to talk to Frank. And Frank saw the preacher. His eyes got really big. And he said, Frank, what's going on? He said, what's happening to you? He said, you used to have it all together, and it seemed like everything was going on. Frank began to tell this tale of of bad investments that led to his downfall, and Just really a sad story, and the preacher listened really well, and he said, Frank, here's what I want you to do. I want you to go home, and I want you to open up your Bible, just real randomly, and I want you to take your finger, and I want you just to stick your finger on a page, and when you read that, I believe God's Word will give you some answers for your life. Well, about that time, the tow truck came and picked him up, and the preacher left, and A few weeks later, uh, the preacher was out in town, and lo and behold, he saw Frank again, this time getting out of a brand new Mercedes, sporting a brand new fancy suit, a Rolex watch, and the preacher went up and said, Frank, man, I'm really glad to see things have turned around for you. And he said, yes, preacher, and I owe it all to you. I owe it all to you, preacher. I did what you said, even in my drunken stupor. I went home, I opened up my Bible, I put my finger down, and there it said chapter 11. It's been a delay, all, all three services, I'm telling you, on that one, all right? Here's the point, friends. The truth, the point is this. I believe the Bible is filled with truth. The Bible can help us because it is the Word of God. I believe that most of life's problems can we be solved in Scripture. God, God's Word can give us the answers for our lives. It, it could be found in chapter 11 of some book in the Bible, or it could be found in some other place. I don't really know. The truth is this. Listen to me. And this is why we preach it, man. This is why this right here is like the foundation of all that we are and, and all that I am as your pastor. Because I really believe that this is God's word and the truth contained can make a difference. It's not a truth. I believe it is the truth. The truth. Scripture is always right because it comes from God. And it's always right to go by the Bible. Years ago, a preacher wrote this. He said, this book contains the mind of God, the state of man, the way of salvation, the doom of sinners, and the happiness of believers. Its doctrines are holy, its precepts are binding, its histories are true, and its decisions are immutable. Read it to be wise, believe it to be safe, practice it to be holy. It contains light to direct you and food to support you and comfort uh, to cheer you. It is the traveler's map, the pilgrim's staff, the pilot's compass, the soldier's sword, the Christian's character. Here, paradise is restored and heaven is open and the gates of hell disclosed. Christ is its grand subject, our good, its design, the glory of God, its end. It should fill the memory, rule the heart, and guide the feet. So friends, the Bible, read it. Read it slowly. Read it frequently. Read it prayerfully. For it is a mine of wealth, a paradise of glory, a river of pleasure. Follow its precepts and it will lead you to Calvary, to the empty tomb, to a resurrected life in Christ, yes, to glory itself for all eternity. That's what the Bible does. And friends, the early church devoted themselves to the study of God's Word, and of course, that's what we do here at Westbrook as well. We we challenge you to bring your Bibles. We challenge you to mark them up and to study the book and learn it and read it over and over and over and over again. Download it on your phone. Start your year off with Bible reading. I think in your program as a Bible reading guide. Man, just... We're serious about this. You want to talk about a great way to be real and relevant? That's where it begins. Less about being hip and trendy, all about this. Here's the second thing. Secondly, the first church committed themselves to a regular time of memorial. Acts chapter 2, verse 42 says, They devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to the breaking of bread. 
You know, about five weeks before this, Jesus had met with his followers and had instituted this last meal. Jot down on your program, Matthew chapter 26 and verse 26 and following. This special time in, in their service and in our service was designed to lead them to focus on Christ and what he had done for them. You catch me on this? This little sliver of time in communion is for you to spend some time focusing on what Jesus has done for you. It's not a time to clean out your purse. It's not a time to clip your fingernails. It's not a time to catch a fast snooze in the dark auditorium with music playing behind. It's a time to remember the sacrifice of Jesus. And some of you are captured with the fact that I said it's not a time to clip your fingernails. What are you talking about? I've been a pastor for 30 years. And there's a lot of people who clip their fingernails during communion. I know that's like really weird, isn't it? My former ministry, there was a guy who every single week during communion clipped his fingernails and left his fingernails on the carpet. <laughs> I'm like, dude, you got to be kidding me. Listen, I fear that some people, they gauge the length of the service according to when communion is or... And I hear this periodically, I hear this periodically, people pay more attention to the fact that the little pieces of bread are different than what we normally use. <laughs> Y'all got new communion bread, what's going on with that? I don't want those little chiclet things. You get all amped about that rather than the specialness of this moment. Folks, here's what happens. We want to design, we want to give you the opportunity, and we try to set it up, and we try to make it happen. It's just a, a brief little time, but we want you to focus on Christ, and we can't make you do that, but we want to encourage you when that time comes for you to let everything else in your mind go away, and you just stand there in awe, or sit there in awe like, oh, Jesus, what have you done for me? Thank you so much. And we provide the space and the time, but it's up to you to make that a reality. What caused the early church to grow, I believe, was their commitment to Christ and, the, and their commitment to remember his sacrifice. What made the early church so amazing was their pledge to remember what Jesus had done for them. But there's more. Number three is a commitment to fellowship. Acts chapter 2 verse 42 says, They devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching, to the breaking of bread, and to fellowship. You see that? Now, we talk a lot about this idea of fellowship around here because uh, that's one of the four markers of what we believe is a healthy disciple, is that you will find connection with other people around you. And it's more than just, it's more than just chatting over coffee when the service is over. It's the sharing of one's heart and the sharing of one's life. It's shared encouragement. It's doing life with each other, with those you love. It's being real and relevant means that you'll share more than just uh, you'll share more than just your family and your marriage photos on fake book. I mean Facebook. It means that you'll open up your life and it'll open up your family and open up your marriage and open up your home and open up your heart so that other people can see the real you. And that's terrifying, isn't it? It is, before you start completely hyperventilating, you know, I know that can be scary. And I know that can be difficult, and I know it can be terrifying, because you're fearful of people judging you or finding out that you really aren't as perfect as you let on that you are. I, I remember this illustration of, of, of a long time ago here in the life of Westbrook. We had a family that started coming to our church. They, they, they came to our church in October of 1996, the very first Sunday that we had church, and they quickly got involved, and they were, they were involved in our worship and, and our, our tech, tech ministry and our children's ministry, and their kids came, and they were very involved, and they were in our small group for like four years, very involved, and the only time they were not here is when they were traveling on business or on vacation, always here, always connected, great family, and then all of a sudden, from one Sunday to the next, they were gone. Like from literally from one Sunday they were at church, the next Sunday they were gone. And they're like, well, we're so-and-so family. So we start making phone calls. They've changed their phone numbers. And then we go over to their house and we knock on their doors. What's going on? Well, and they gave us some excuses. I'll tell you what was happening in their life. We got one step too close. 
Not even me. Their small group got one step too close to them, and they're like, mm, nope, that's as far as I'm going to let you go. I don't. They didn't want people to know what was really going on in their house. It is terrifying, I know. I know. But here's the deal. Let me look around the room here real fast. Let me shade my eyes. I don't see a single perfect person in this room. <laughs> I hope you're talking about yourself, not somebody that's... Okay. Now, some of you are a little bit closer than others of being perfect. <laughs> some of you are really far away from that. Let me tell you something. We love you just as you are. And when, we, when you walk in the room, and when, you, when, we, when we say, how are you? We want you to be real with us. We want you to tell us. Happened, happened just before this service started. How are you? I said to this person, how are you? You know? I'm like, man, I'm glad you told me. Come see me. Let me pray with you before you leave today. That's being real. That's being relevant. It has nothing to do with being hip and trendy and cool in the hottest place in town. It's mean being real with each other. That's fellowship. Here's the fourth thing, and I'm going to hustle. Fourthly, what I believe the early church caused it to grow was a commitment to prayer. Acts chapter 2, verse 42, one more time. It says, they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching, to the breaking of bread, to fellowship, and to Pray. prayer. And to prayer. Somebody said this. Write this down. Write this one down. This is a good one. It wasn't me that said this. Somebody else said it. They said, when we work, we work. But when we pray... God works. I think that was true of the first church. Every time we come into God's presence in prayer, He blesses us. He may not bless us exactly as we want or as we ask or when we want, but He blesses. And we should keep on coming. We should keep on coming. So I know some people say, I don't want to bother God with my little problems. He's got the world to solve, you know? I don't want to bother God. Let me tell you something. I don't, people say, I don't want to bug God. I'm a God bugger. I just keep coming back over and over and over again. It's not that I don't believe that God remembers what I'm asking for. If nothing else, it's more for me because then it keeps me focused upon God directing my paths and not me. Reminds me of the story of a little Marcy. She, a little girl, uh, she, she had been tormented all day by her four-year-old brother, Will, and he had been tormenting her. And finally that night, she got down on her knees and she was saying her prayers before she went to bed. And and she, she asked God to bless her brother Will and to keep him from tormenting her in the future. And when she finished praying, she said amen, and she was standing up, and it was at that point she remembered that she had asked God about that problem before, and she added the following words to her prayer, and she said, and dear God, by the way, I've mentioned this to you before several times. <laughs> have you all mentioned stuff to God several times before? I have. Let me tell you something. I believe that our Heavenly Father is in the blessing business. And, and I'm just going to keep on coming to Him because the more we pray, the more that He blesses. And He may not bless us immediately or just like we ask Him to, but He will bless us. Matthew 7, verse 11. I love this verse. It says, If you then, though you are evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your Father in heaven give good gifts to those who ask Him? And so we want you to be a part of our prayer ministry. The last bunch of years, we've prayed on Wednesday nights at a thing called We Pray. We switched it this year to Friday nights. And now it's called the night of worship and prayer. And we switched it to Friday nights so that we could do it in conjunction with our Gente Unida congregation. And it's a great night. This past a couple weeks ago, the first Friday night of the month, we had it with Hinte Unida. The majority of people there were from the Hinte congregation. I want to encourage more and more and more of our morning Westbrook congregation to be there as well. When we work, we work. When we pray, God works. Now, if you've been around Westbrook much, you know that we're completely committed to this. Faithfully preach God's word. Remember his sacrifice every week. Constantly challenge you to get plugged into connection and ministry and fellowship. We challenge you to pray. One of my resolute goals this year as your pastor is to spend more time in the word. 
more time praying and prepping for messages, more time spending in time in prayer for you, because I believe that those were the faithful foundational elements of the first century church that made it a powerhouse church. And I believe that those are the same elements that can be the foundation of Westbrook. And I'm just telling you, you never know, I, I, I may get a tattoo someday. All right? I may. Because I heard it hurts, and I, and I don't really like that too much. And I'll be honest with you, I, I, I've always wanted to let my hair grow really long, like Aragorn, you know, of, of Lord of the Rings. Christy may nix that, I, I'm not really sure. And I, I promise you'll never wear skinny jeans. I'm, a fat, I'm an old fat guy, all right? <laughs> promise you I won't do that. Uh, but without a doubt, we're going to push the envelope with technology and, and creativity and with music. And I know sometimes uh, people come in here and they're like, it's too loud. It's too loud in your church. Music is too loud. The drums are too loud. Let me tell you something. Next time I go to India, you have no idea how loud a church service can be. I'm, it's crazy. I, I preached last Sunday morning. There was well over a thousand people in this area. It was this long shotgun kind of venue. And, and they had two speaker columns on either side of the podium. I thought I was at a Kenny Chesney concert. It was so loud. And you're like, it's too loud. Well, you know what? We should get like earplugs, right? So maybe in the future, we're just going to get earplugs and put them back on the guest central table. And if you think it's too loud, don't complain. Just put earplugs in. Put two, two sets of earplugs in. All right? We're, we're going to push the envelope with those kind of things and with technology. Not so that we can be hip and cool and, and trendy and so forth. And I know it sounds antithetical, but, but I believe being real and relevant, listen to me, is less about the trendy things of our modern culture and more about the realness of our church and our life in Jesus Christ. I believe that being real and relevant is less about the trendy things of our culture and more about a faithful connection to people in our church and people that we're trying to reach in our community and people in our world that need Jesus Christ. That's being real and relevant. And we're faithful to that. So, so as a real and relevant church, first of all, I want us to commit to a couple other things. First of all, I want us to commit to understanding the times that we live in. Much like the men of Issachar in 1 Chronicles chapter 12, it says there in that passage that, that there are these 200 leaders who understood the times and they had a grasp on what they should do to lead God's people through that. Being relevant will mean that we grasp the culture that we live in and we alter our methods to reach people without changing the message that can change people. Did you catch that? So we're not going to change our message. We may change our methods, but, but we're, going to, we're going to do whatever we have to do to reach people. Here's the second thing. As a real and relevant church, I pray that we'll be faithful to meeting people and families where they are. No pretense, no judgment, just love and blessing. I think if I read scripture right, that's what Jesus did. He just like met people where they were and accepted them for who they are and just loved them for what they were going through, pointed them to the hope of God. And that's, I pray that that's what Westbrook will be a church. We're all about that. We're all about letting people know that, hey, God can make a way when there seems to be no way. Here's the third thing. Lastly, as a real and relevant church, I want us to commit to staying faithful to the unchanging. When the world is constantly changing around us, our God never changes. Malachi 3.6 tells us that his love never changes, his word never changes, his promise never changes. And while we may change our strategy and our methods and our structure, I pray that we can hold fast to God's word and to the work that he has for us. And I'm committed to that. You know, I, this year our, our, in our preaching and teaching time, the sermon time, we're going to spend more time in 2018 in a verse-by-verse -verse expositional preaching than ever before. In fact, of the nine series that we're preaching, four of them, which encompass 34 weekends of the year, are all Bible-based expository sermons. 67% of our preaching this year is just going to be verse-by-verse -verse preaching. Less catchy how-to sermons, more Bible teaching that can apply to your life. So get ready for that. The vibrant first century church was all about that, all about that. And I challenge our church to be the same. 
first century church was all about knowing Christ fully and making him known. And let's do that. And when we do this, when we're faithful to this, people look up here. When we're faithful to that, I believe you can say, I love my church. I love this church. Because it's all about God. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, your plan to bring people to you was a place called the church and you designed it and you planned it and you loved it and you died for it. May we realize that this, may we realize that this was what your three-year ministry set up, the place for people to be able to connect with you. And you loved your church. And thank goodness that we today can learn about it and we can say the same thing. And it can make a difference. Help us to be people that make a difference in a world that needs a change in their life. In your name we pray.